the tenants are built about 30 feet under the surface level and they are building the material which is called conglomerate. These are natural deposits. So they build the network of the tunnels. They are all leveled. As a matter of fact, there is one and a half degrees, you know, uh, to the exit. Why? Because it's a perfect for the slow drainage. If it was perfectly level, then you would see water everywhere. If it was 5 or 10 degrees, then the water flow would be too strong, too hard, it would kill the walls. The next thing, when you enter there, you could see that a couple of 300 feet from the entrance, even 1,000 feet from the entrance, the air flow is so perfect, the air ventilation. You could, you could just feel the breeze. It means that somebody had such a sophisticated way and engineering skills to get that air flow. Today, if you go to the coal mining facility, you know you need air, you need oxygen. Mm -hmm. They pump the oxygen, but here, whoever built it, they knew how to you know, supply all the parts of the tunnel labyrinth with the air. So I would say in order to build something like that, such uh, advanced complex underground, people had to have advanced engineering skills. And you know, above the ground we have the biggest pyramids on the planet. We have so far discovered five of them and we call them Sun, Moon, Dragon, Earth and Love. But underground, a huge underground labyrinth. And you know, when you see the trees in the nature, if they are like 100 feet tall, oh, that usually, was amazing. That usually, was amazing. Yes, usually there is 100 feet, uh, you know, of the root system underground. The similar thing is here with the pyramids. A huge pyramids above and a huge network underground. So somebody applied very advanced knowledge. First, before that, they had to plan you know, they had, uh, you know, very advanced architectural knowledge. So I would say we are in the face of something that uh, is so significant and we want more people to come and see that. Right, absolutely. It's a fascinating place. And right now, most of the pyramids are still covered in dirt, about three feet of dirt, right? And trees, and you were talking about trees. I thought you were going to talk about the roots of the trees. Tell me about that because that was so fascinating. Well, what we have on the top of the Bosnian pyramids is mostly the pine tree. The pine tree has the ability that releases some type of the liquid through the roots. And that liquid basically melts everything. If it is natural stone, you know, it melts and then uh, the root goes through it with no problem, like, like, like a drill. And uh, in the case of natural stones, and we have several places like that, the pine tree goes easily through that. But in our case, when after three feet of the soil, when it gets to the surface of the concrete block, it simply cannot go through the cemented concrete surface, and then it goes left and right. Very interesting phenomenon, which tells us that in order to investigate the Bosnian pyramids, it's not enough just to apply archaeological knowledge. I mean, we are applying geology, paleontology, biology, but also we combine them with very sophisticated scientists today like satellite screening, screening thermal screening, georadar analysis. People, you know, came from Germany, from Russia, from Serbia with georadar instruments, so they were able to penetrate the surface, so we know where the passageways are, we know that the chambers are below, we know that, you know, the concrete blocks are on top of each other because we can see that through those you know, sophisticated pieces of equipment. And it's, uh, I would call it the most exciting archaeological project in the world today. Oh, and I think the most important of any of our lifetime, anyone who's watching the show, at least, wouldn't you say? <laughs> at least? Exactly right. And like I said in the beginning, we are really blessed, you know, to live uh, during those times. The 21st century really have such an extreme uh, you know, positions. On one side, you have a lot of people who are ignorant, who don't care about the ancient history, who don't care about the books. All they care are their iPods or phones or computers. But really, there are so many things to learn about the nature, about this planet, about the ancient civilizations, about the knowledge. When you go in Bosnia, when you face with such a huge and uh, old, you know, uh, complex, then you realize, you know, uh, how advanced those people were. I mean, amazing. They live differently, did not have technology, the cameras, 
you know, the computers like we do, but they knew this planet better than we do. They knew the energy of the planet better. Well, they also had some form of communication if all these pyramids have such precise similarities. I mean, from China to Central America. Somebody was talking to somebody. Exactly right. I would say that the communication between the continents is very old, between Africa and South America, between Europe and North America, between Asia and South America. And uh, historians and archaeologists will have to admit to that. And uh, about the pyramid science, I think in 21st century it will become a, spir you know, uh, a science for itself. Uh, I think we are to learn so many things about the shape, about the effects of the pyramids. The interesting thing is that uh, this year, 2010, we've done some analysis of the Bosnian pyramid of the sun. We came with the instruments, we were measuring, you know, hertz, kilohertz, megahertz and gigahertz. We wanted to see if there are some anomalies. And in the range of the kilohertz, when we came to the very top of the sun pyramid, we notice that in the radius of 12 feet there is an energy beam coming from the center of the pyramid. And that's amazing because we measured it for three full days and that energy beam is continuous. Now, the frequency is 28 kilohertz. 28 kilohertz is the frequency of the ultrasound. Now, for the ultrasound you have to have source, artificial source. It can be a mechanical device, it can be electromagnetic machine, or it can be so-called piezoelectrical effect. And that's when you take the quartz crystal, you press it, you squash it, and then you can see electrical, you know, current coming out. So if you are pressing continuously, then you can see electricity coming out from the quartz crystal. But in any case, mechanical, electromagnetic, or piezoelectrical effect, these are artificial sources of the energy. Which one the pyramid has? We don't know. But it tells us... Or something maybe in, in none of those categories. Exactly we right. Know. We have to stay open, of course. Right. But in any case, somebody knew that there was something under the pyramid or they built something inside the pyramid. Because it's not, you know, accident that we have the energy beam coming exactly through the center of the top of the pyramid. Now, we measure that energy, the intensity. The interesting thing is, on the surface, the intensity is less than when you go above, 10 feet, 20 feet. What does that mean? It means that the source is probably not inside the pyramid, but somewhere above. What does that mean? It means that you have some type of the, you know, artificial intelligence or intelligence above us. So this is now, a receiver of some kind. Exactly. Now it opens completely new door. That's why I'm saying we are doing some pioneering steps in the case of the Bosnian pyramids. If you try to do a similar experiment in Egypt, they will not let you do that because they are saying, no, these are tombs, you know, the case over. We don't want to discuss So they never tested any, the energy? No. They don't want to discuss that. Because the guy who is in charge, Dr. Zahi Havas, he does not let anyone do that. So we will need to wait until he's gone to do some real testing of Egyptian pyramids. Don't forget that what they called Cheops, Catherine, or Mycenaean pyramids, they don't have bones, mummies, hieroglyphic writings, royal furniture. They don't have not a single proof who built them, what was the purpose. How did they do it? If you try to repeat that construction feast of building the Cheops pyramid, two million tons of material, some of the blocks are 250 tons, and move them from Aswan, which is 600 miles, so they fit so perfectly here on the Giza Plateau, we couldn't do it today with our technology of the 21st century. So they had something better than we have today. Exactly yeah. right. And you know, if we admit it, that's not shame. The shame is if we think that we know the best, that we think, you know, that we know all the answers, and we are wrong. So when you try to talk about these things with the people who run the scientific institutions, with directors of archaeological institutes, or professors, or deans, or, you know, 
then you get the wall in front of you. Their problem is that they think they know everything and they should filter all the information. And that's so mm -hmm. wrong. You know, as long as we behave as students and we are open for the new knowledge, there is a hope for us. But if you think that the moment that we got our professorships or our PhD or our position in this institute that we learned everything, that we know everything, then we become obstacle for the scientific progress. Well, you have to, but playing devil's advocate, what you're talking about, and I don't disagree with you, but is could change the very foundation of religion, science, history, and in my opinion, even uh, health and wellness down the road for various reasons. But so we're talking about sort of shifting the foundation of everything we know. And I know sort of like a, a grown person finds out, you know, they're 30 years old and all of a sudden they find out they're adopted. So their whole history's changed. What's wrong you know, with that? Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. And Just we saying. should change that. And I know it's a high price. You know, PhDs have to be changed, the, you know, the way the books are written, the way the professors teach their students. So what? We need to change that. You know, when I discovered the Bosnian pyramids, one of my biggest opponents in Sarajevo, in Bosnia, he's like leading archaeologist in Bosnia, he came one day on TV with this encyclopedia, which is published in 1967, and he said, in this encyclopedia, which is basically based on references from 62, 58, 55, 60 years ago. He said, in this encyclopedia, I listed all the archaeological sites in the Balkan region. Here we don't have pyramids, therefore they don't exist. Now, imagine that. He's coming with a book, 60 years old, and he's saying, well, this site is not mentioned here, does not exist. In other words, let's not investigate, let's not research, because everything is already discovered. That's so bad. It's our story and we're sticking to it, right? Exactly. Yeah. We need to change that. Now, our problem as a society, we have divided the knowledge to so many scientific disciplines, which we call biology or anthropology or history or physics. Or wrong. There is only one knowledge, there is only one universal truth. It doesn't matter which way you're going to use to get there. Our problem is that we make distinction, again, between the physical and spiritual science. You know, we want to base everything on our physical senses. It's simply not enough, especially in the case of the pyramids. In order to explain them, we need to watch them through at least three different realms, physical, energy, and spiritual. Interesting. Well, great. I want to thank you so much for joining us today. This has been fascinating. And uh, I, I don't know where it's going to take you, but I know there's already been an incredible journey, and I'm sure you're not through yet. <laughs> so, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. I hope it's been as fascinating for you as it has for me. And let's remember that at one point, the whole world thought the world was flat, too. And we discovered that was wrong. So, something to think about. I'm Peggy Sue Skipper. We'll see you next time.